Hi, welcome to Product and Quotient Rules and Higher Order Derivatives. My name is Tuesday J. Johnson. I'm a lecturer for the University of Texas at El Paso and an assistant professor at Doniana Community College. This lecture is for Math 1411 Calculus at UTEP. Chapter 2 Differentiation comes from Larson's 11th edition calculus text. This is section 2.3, Product and Quotient Rules and Higher Order Derivatives. In part 1, I talked about the pro product rule. In part 2, I talked about the quotient rule. And now here in part 3, we're going to bring those together and look at some higher order derivatives. Example 1, we're going to find the derivative of f of x equals x to the 7th plus 3x to the 4th, all times multiplied by a quotient. So within an overwhelming product, we have a quotient we have to take care of. What does that mean? It means when we find the derivative of f, we're going to use the product rule, but within the product rule, we need a quotient rule. So it'll be first, derivative of the second, using our derivative notation, plus second, times the derivative of the first. Okay, that's, that's our structure. That's telling us what we need to do, but we need to actually take these derivatives. So in our next line, we'll have x to the seventh plus 3x to the fourth. And then we'll use the quotient rule for sine of x over x. That's low x, d high cosine of x, minus high sine of x, d low derivative of x is 1, all over low squared, so that's x squared in the denominator, plus sine of x over x, and we'll take the derivative of the polynomial portion to get 7x to the 6 plus 12x cubed. Now this is a great answer, fantastic answer if you're not doing anything else with it, but to simplify, you know, might be worth your time, verify that I have simplified this correctly. I noticed the sine of x and the sine of x, we're going to combine terms from both pieces in order to find our final term here. In this case, we have sine of x all multiplied by 3x to the negative 2 plus 5x, all of that divided by cosine of x minus 7. So for this, we have an overwhelming quotient in which the numerator, or the high part of our quotient rule, has a product in it. So we'll take low d high, and I wrote it in derivative notation, uh, so it's low d high minus high d low, all over low squared. This is a great way to write it to remind yourself if there's multiple rules going on. I'm using the product within the quotient rule. Or in the past example, I'm using the quotient rule within the product rule. And now we could go back and we can take these individual derivatives. Cosine of x minus 7. And then derivative of a product, I'm going to use the product rule. It's a sine of x times a negative 6x to the negative 3 plus 5. So derivative of the second. Plus second. 3x to the negative 2 plus 5x times the derivative of the first, derivative of sine is cosine. Notice those are in brackets, my product rule, keeping everything together, just like the brackets I had above. Minus sine of x, 3x to the negative 2 plus 5x, and then we'll find the derivative of cosine x minus 7. That's a negative a sine of x minus 0, but we're not going to write the minus 0, over denominator squared. You could absolutely simplify this but I'm not sure that we want to. So using the product and quotient rules, specifically the quotient rules, we can find the derivatives of the remaining trigon trigonometric functions. We know the derivative of sine is cosine. We know the derivative of cosine is sine. They stick together. The derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. The derivative of secant of x is secant of x tangent of x. Remember the Pythagorean identities from uh, trigonometry. Tangent and secant stick together in calculus and in trig uh, as we're learning it. The derivative of the cotangent of x is negative cosecant squared of x, and the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. Just like in the Pythagorean identities, cotangent and cosecant stick together. Sine and cosine stick together, right? Also, all of the co-functions have a derivative that is negative. So all the co-functions have derivatives that are negative. Let's take a look at one, and if you want to verify the other three, feel free. So the derivative of tangent of x is supposedly secant squared. Let's see why. 
let's let y equal tangent of x, which we know to be sine of x over cosine of x. Using the quotient rule, we have low cosine of x, d high, derivative of sine is cosine, minus high, d low, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, all over cosine squared, all right, low squared. Cosine of x times cosine of x is cosine squared of x. Minus sine of x times a negative sine of x is positive sine squared of x, all over cosine squared. But we know, right, Pythagorean identity, cosine squared x plus sine squared x is 1. 1 over cosine squared x is indeed reciprocal identity for secant squared of x. The other three similar steps to verify. So now let's take some of these rules and just use them. If f of theta is theta plus 1 times cosine of theta, right, theta is our derivative now, then the derivative is theta plus 1 times the derivative of cosine, so that's negative sine theta, plus cosine of theta times the derivative of theta plus 1. Theta is our variable. The derivative of theta is 1. The derivative of 1 is 0, which I'm far too lazy to write. You can clean it up a little bit. Theta times a negative sine theta is negative theta sine theta, minus 1 a sine theta, and plus a cosine theta that I led my function with so that I didn't lose any negative signs out in front. To take the derivative of y equals x plus cotangent of x, the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of co function is negative. The derivative of cotangent specifically of x is minus cosecant squared of x. And that's it. Walk away. The derivative of y equals secant of x over x using the quotient rule is x times secant of x tangent of x, the derivative of secant, minus secant of x, that's high, d low, the derivative of x is 1, all over low squared. And one version is not any better necessarily than another, but I factored out a secant of x in the two terms in the numerator, and I'm left with x tangent of x minus 1 in parentheses. Number four, y equals x sine of x plus cosecant of x. x sine of x is a product rule. We have our first term as x and our second term as sine of x. It might help as you're doing some of these problems to underline or do as I did in the product rules. u of x equals x, find u prime. v of x equals sine of x, find v prime, and then you can put them together. Here we have first derivative of the second plus second derivative of the first. So I've taken care of my product rule. These all go there. I should make that a y prime, my bad. The derivative is x cosine of x plus sine of x times one, product rule. Derivative of cosecant of x is minus cosecant x cotangent of x. Leave it, walk away. Maybe you don't wanna write the multiplied by one. Maybe you do, it's up to you. Number five, h of theta is five theta times secant of theta plus than, theta times tangent of theta. Listen to what I said. Five of theta multiplied by secant of theta. That's a product rule. Plus theta times tangent of theta. Another product rule. So I'm going to use the product rule twice. I'm going to have five theta times the derivative of secant plus secant of theta times the derivative of five theta. And then, so plus, I'm going to have theta times the derivative of tangent plus tangent times the derivative of theta. In the bottom line, I get rid of my parentheses, rewrite my 5 as a coefficient of secant so it doesn't accidentally sneak inside of the secant, and I eliminate the 1 from parentheses because tangent of theta times 1, that's just tangent of theta. Now let's find some equations, equation or equations, of the tangent lines to the graph of f of x equals x plus 1 over x minus 1 that are parallel to the line 2y plus x equals 6. Let's take this a step at a time. First of all, if it's parallel to the given line, let's find the slope of the given line. We're going to subtract x, divide everything by 2 so we could take the slope. m equals a negative 1 half. That's all we care about. We want to find the slope is negative 1 half. Why do we care? It's because we know equations of tangent lines have slopes that are derivatives of the function. 
And if the derivative is parallel to this line, right, the derivative, the, the slope of the tangent line is parallel to this given line, I know then that the derivative of my function must equal this negative one half. All right. So if the derivative of my function must equal a negative one half, let's find this derivative. I know that f prime of x is low, x minus one, d high, one, minus high, x plus one, d low, one, all over low squared. Distribute. x minus one times one is x minus one. Minus parentheses x plus one is a minus x and a minus one. The x's cancel out. I get negative one minus one, which is negative two, over x minus one all squared. And I need to find, right, where's the derivative equal to negative one half? Well, I have my derivative, negative two over x minus one all squared, equals a negative one half. Let's solve that. Negative one half equals negative two over x minus one squared, cross multiply. One times x minus one all squared is x minus one all squared. I use the negative with the two in both sides. Negative two times negative two is four. The square root property allows us to take the square root of both sides of an equation, and we'll get similar results as long as we include plus or minus. Anytime you choose to do the square root, you have to remember to add the plus or minus. Square root of four plus or minus two. So if x minus one equals two, I add one and get x equals three. If x minus 1 equals negative 2, I add 1 and I get x equals negative 1. But I'm not finished yet. Find equations of the tangent lines to the graph of the function that are parallel. Okay, so step 3, find the corresponding y values, and then we can actually, finally, find the equations of the tangent lines. For an x value of negative 1 and an x value of 3, I can find y values. When x is negative 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0 over negative 2, so y is 0. And I can write the equation of the tangent line as y equals a negative 1 half x minus 1 half. When x is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4. 3 minus 1 is 2. 4 over 2 gives me a y value of 2. And then I can write the equation of the tangent line as y minus 2 equals the negative 1 half times all of x minus 3. Distribute add two to both sides, and I should end up with y equals a negative one-half x plus seven halves. Just as we can find the derivative of a position function to find velocity, we can find the derivative of the velocity function, because that's all it is as a function, in order to find acceleration. Though direct applications might run out after the third derivative, which is called the jerk function, you know how your head snaps back when you're accelerating? That's the jerk function. We can take derivatives as long as we want to. Uh, we continue to use the tick marks up to the third derivative, and then we'll switch to the notation with the superscript number in parentheses. So we might have an original function y, its first derivative, y prime, its second derivative, y double prime, its third derivative, but then it gets a little nonsensical, and so we'll have the fourth derivative written in parentheses. That's a four, not a y. Let's see if I can make that a little more explicit. Not really, but hopefully you get the idea. So let's take a look at an example. An automobile's velocity starting from rest is v of t equals 100t all over 2t plus 15, where v is measured in feet per second. So we're gonna find the acceleration at five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. But keep in mind, to find acceleration, we have to find the derivative of velocity. So the derivative of velocity is 2t plus 15 times 100, so low d high minus high times the derivative of low, derivative of 2t plus 15 is two, all over low squared. And when I distribute 2t times 100, and 100t times two. One is positive, one is negative, they cancel out. So I'll end up with 1500 in the numerator over 2t plus 15 all squared. Find the acceleration at the following values for our acceleration a of five. We substitute five for our t value, 1500 over 25 squared is about 2.4 feet per second squared. At 10 seconds, we'll have 1,500 over 35 squared, which is about 1.22 feet per second squared. 
and at 20 seconds, my acceleration is 0.50 feet per second squared. Does this make sense? If you're starting from rest, it makes sense. You'll have a higher acceleration rate at the beginning, and then it tapers off as you get closer to the speed that you're looking to go. Product and quotient rule examples. Let me know if you have any feedback in the comments. Thanks for watching.